Thank you for praying for us as we traveled the U.S. And uh, we also had a, a couple of changes that happened to our family while we were away. Um, the one is, uh, actually both are in this photo, uh, the guy in the middle, in the blue, all of our kids grew like crazy while we were back, um, but the guy in the middle in the blue who, uh, if you look close, you might recognize him. He used to be a long-haired drummer sitting behind me here. Um, our oldest son, Joshua. Uh, Joshua did not come back to Ethiopia with us. Uh, he stayed in the States, and he is now serving with a disaster relief organization. He spent 12 weeks in a boot camp in the heat of Louisiana, and uh, then soon after finishing that, got deployed to Israel. Uh, so now he is in Israel serving in a camp that serves Syrian refugees. And so please pray for him. Um, he's, he's doing great there, and he loves it. The other change that happened to our family is in Christie's arms over here. You see little Malachi Johannes, born on October 6th, and um, he is a delight. Um, what a joy uh, to welcome him into our family. So thank you for praying for us. Um, mom did great, baby did great, safe, um, great labor, great um, pregnancy, so thank you for keeping us in your prayers. It is a delight to be back, especially to be back to serve um, and under Pastor David, I'm so happy for the ways that you have, have wrapped your arms around him and welcomed him here. And it's a delight to see what God is doing in this, this next season here at IEC. And so it's a joy to serve with you, David. And uh, we will be here. Uh, technically, I'll be at IEC until the end of December. And then January 26th, we leave Ethiopia. Uh, and so after being here eight years, so, you know, there's, we, we have our own things we're processing through at the moment. But thank you for your prayers. Uh, today begins Advent, as we've already mentioned, uh, this season in the church calendar where we refocus on Jesus' coming and His promised return. And each week during a series here, we'll, we, we will consider Jesus coming through the eyes of someone who was there at His first coming. We'll see the transformation that happens in their lives and also try to learn from their responses. Today we're going to look at an ordinary man, an ordinary man by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah was living an ordinary life, but a life filled with some pain. The pain of being childless. Yet what we see in Zechariah's life and his wife Elizabeth as well is that they are faithful and obedient to God. And then as God's mission intersects this ordinary man's life, there's a radical transformation that occurs. So today for us, I would like us to consider how Jesus' coming intersects with our ordinary lives and brings a radical transformation for us as well. And how that intersection happens many times when we least expect it. So let's turn and look at God's intervention in the ordinary life of Zechariah. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 5 and read to verse 25, and then we'll skip a little bit and pick up again in verse 57. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. 
He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened, and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a gift to us. And we pray that today you would speak to us through your word, change us, transform us by your word and by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, now reading the story of Zechariah, I have something in common with him that I haven't had before. You know, that in my advanced age, as an old man, all of a sudden I find out that you're going to have a baby. I mean, there's a lot, of it, a lot of surprise that comes in the midst of that. At the same time, there's great joy and amazing anticipation. So I feel like I can, you know, relate to Zechariah in a bit different way today. The context in which this passage takes place is a very dark time in history. King Herod was the ruler. He was an egomaniac that makes today's ego-driven leaders look very tame by comparison. He killed wives. He killed sons. He built a temple to keep peace, but he also built shrines to false gods. He, declared, he was declared king of the Jews, but he was always seen as a fake, as an imposter. He levied huge taxes to pay for his projects, causing great oppression on the people. He was godless. He was feared. He was oppressive. You may remember of him killing all the male children at Jesus' coming, creating an infanticide. At the same time, it's said that he ordered the popular citizens to be killed at the time of his death because he wanted to make sure that there were people grieving for him in the street after he was gone. You know, his human rights record was terrible, let's face it. He was hated. He was another Pharaoh that people needed to be rescued from. So while it was a dark time in history, it also was a dark time for Zechariah and Elizabeth personally. They were seen as blessed people. They were relatives of the priest Aaron. But at the same time, they were seen as cursed people. Because Elizabeth could not have children. She was childless. They were shame-filled, and they were old, and they were without hope. 
poor Elizabeth and Zechariah, they were righteous, observing God's commands blamelessly. But yet I wonder if at times they thought to themselves, what have we done that keeps God from blessing us with a child? Childless, cursed, rejected, shame-filled, despised, barren, forgotten. Yet God meets them in the midst of the darkness of their political world and the darkness of their personal world. You know, here's the beauty of the gospel. Here's the beauty of Advent is that we remember that God meets us in the darkness then and now. He did so in the coming of Jesus. And so if you ever feel like the impossible darkness has arrived in your life, maybe it's because of family problems, or maybe you're childless, or maybe you're sick or burnt out, you're unemployed or you're overworked, you're cast off or forgotten, or maybe you're overwhelmed by the crisis that we see in every corner of the world. Here's the good news, that God meets us in the darkness then and now. In Zechariah's story, God changes their lives, but He also still changes our stories today, and He has hope to offer to the whole world. So this morning, we're going to look at three ideas that we can learn from Zechariah in this text and his response. We start in verses 6 through 9. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. The first idea is a call to believe that God will use the ordinary, that God will use the ordinary. It's not about doing something great for God. Rather, the call is to simple obedience, daily doing the ordinary. Mother Teresa once said, God does not require that we be successful, only faithful. That's what he requires of us. In verse 6, we read about the righteousness of, of Zechariah. And Elizabeth, we read that they obeyed, that they observed God's commands. They were barren, yet obedient. They were upright, yet the physical blessing had been withheld by God. They loved God, yet they suffered. This breaks the idea that if we do everything right and have enough faith, then God is somehow obligated to make us healthy and wealthy and wise. It was certainly not true for Elizabeth and Zechariah. They were ordinary people doing ordinary life, trying to obey God while waiting for His deliverance. Praying and waiting, and praying and waiting, and praying and waiting. In verses 8 to 9, we read of how Zechariah was on duty. Two times per year, the priest went to the temple for one week of religious ritual. This was a lifelong, ordinary duty that you just kept doing. It, was, it had a sense of honor, yet nothing special really ever happened when you went to do it. It's kind of like for some of us going to church. You know, we come to church out of duty because that's what happens on Sunday morning, right? Right? And we come and we have a nice time as we meet people and as we sing songs to God. But many of us never come with the expectation that today we might actually meet God and be changed by Him. Zechariah here is chosen for a special honor. By lot, he draws a straw to enter into the holy place to burn incense in God's presence as a symbol of the prayers of the people. Now they tied a rope around him when he went into that place so that just in case God showed up and he was struck dead, they could pull him back out. But nobody really expected that God would show up. It's just ordinary going on. I mean, God had been silent for a long time, yet they still kept on doing the ritual. Then we come to verse 10. 
And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And then verse 21. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. The people were raising their voices in prayer as Zechariah went in to burn the incense. But by verse 21, the people start to wonder, what's taking Zechariah so long? This never takes a long time. I mean, we do the same ritual every day. I mean, I'm late for lunch. I need to get somewhere. He needs to speed this thing along. This ritual is taking way too long. I mean, Zechariah, why are you doing it differently? Well, we find out it's because God is breaking in to the moment of this ordinary ritual taking place. In verse 23, we see another ordinary example. We read, when, his time, when Zechariah's time of service was completed, he returned home. Imagine this for a moment. Zechariah has this God encounter where he finds out that his years of being childless are about to change. He's had this amazing God encounter where he finds out he's going to have a son. And what does Zechariah do? He stays put and he keeps doing his duty until it's finished. He keeps participating in the ordinary ritual until his time is completed. And then we read that he goes home. You see, duty continues for Zechariah. He loves God and he keeps doing the ordinary. So for you and I, may we believe that God will use the ordinary. And may we keep loving Him and obeying Him and sticking to it. Just the ordinary parts of life. The second thing we learn from Zechariah's example, verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. The second thing we learn, expect God to do the extraordinary. So we believe that God will use the ordinary, but we expect God to do the extraordinary. Steve Furtick once wrote, Extraordinary moves of God begin with ordinary acts of obedience. Zechariah's ordinary life is intersected by God's extraordinary mission here. And he never saw it coming. While he had an expectation as a priest that God does move or God could move, and I imagine that he and, Zechariah, he and Elizabeth had prayed for years for God's intervention, yet he is surprised when God moves here. The angel Gabriel appears and says, Zechariah, yes, you, old man. Guess what? You're going to be a dad, Zechariah. God begins to do the extraordinary in his life. In verses 24 to 25, look at Elizabeth's response here. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. God has done the extraordinary in Elizabeth's life. God has shown his favor. He has honored me. He has taken away my shame and disgrace. But it's really easy today to view this passage with skepticism. I mean, does God really still do the extraordinary? Does God really still transform the ordinary? Can He remove my disgrace and my shame? Can I really know His favor? Well, here's what we know. He did it for Elizabeth, and He loves to still do it today. He loves to turn that which is cursed into blessed. And he loves to turn that which is disgraced into favored by God. Here we see an embracing of the unexpected as God is working. But the extraordinary continues here. We see it in Zechariah's struggles. He can't believe what has happened. So God does the extraordinary. He makes Zechariah mute. God is doing the extraordinary here in order to bring His mission into greater fullness. In verse 44, we also read more extraordinary, more miraculous here. We read where Elizabeth and Mary meet. 
Mary, by this point in time, she is with child. She is pregnant with Jesus. And we read this. Elizabeth says, As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Imagine. Here is Elizabeth greeting Mary, and baby John is inside of Elizabeth leaping for joy because Mary is carrying the Lord Jesus. Verse 65, we see more. The neighbors were all filled with awe. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with them. They expected that the boy would be named after Zechariah. And first, Elizabeth says, no, his name is going to be John. And the people don't believe him, and so Zechariah writes on the paper, his name is John, and as soon as he writes it, his tongue is suddenly loose, his mouth is open, and now he can speak again. God doing the extraordinary. And the neighbors say, what will this child become? What is God doing among us today? Perhaps that's an important question for us to ask as well. What is God doing among us today? You see, we live in the ordinary. We have daily tasks. We come, we worship together. We walk out obedience. We work, most of us work normal jobs. Yet we must recognize that God is extraordinary. And at times, he will break into the ordinary and have his way among us. So today, could God do the extraordinary for us? Could he break in to our ordinary lives today with the extraordinary for you or for me? I mean, what if God turned everything upside down among us today and it truly, truly we no longer could play it safe. But rather, we saw this extraordinary God that we would follow with our all, whatever he leads us into. The third thing from this passage, verses 18 to 19. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. Actually, the angel scolded him here. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. The third idea is to keep trusting God to show himself. We have a loving Heavenly Father who cares for us and who loves us and who wants to show himself and make himself known to us. But I'm a lot like Zechariah. I believe that God can break in, but I struggle to trust him to do it. And I struggle to trust him when he breaks in, to keep following him intently. Here we see Zechariah. He believed God that, could, that God could bring him a child. Perhaps he had prayed for years for this child. But when the angel spoke, Zechariah could not trust that God really, really meant it. He was standing in God's presence with an in, in the midst of an angelic encounter. I mean, this rarely happens, right? But rather than trust, Zechariah questions the angel Gabriel. He questions him as a messenger and, in essence, is questioning God's character and God's ability. So he's struck with a consequence for his lack of trust. Zechariah, we learn, can no longer speak. Now, I know, wives, you wish that would happen to your husbands, and husbands, you might wish that happened to your wives, but we see that there's a consequence that comes here. But it seems very harsh to us. We begin to say, oh, come on, God. Give him a break. Cut him some slack. I mean, he just got unbelievable news. But what we learn here is that God takes our trust very seriously. We see it in this consequence that comes to Zechariah. God uses this event for a sign and wonder as he will again open Zechariah's mouth. For us here today, we pray for God to break in. But if he moves, will we embrace him with trust? Or will we demand that he does it on our terms is the question. 
You know, for me, we're in the midst of transition. We're moving away from Ethiopia. We're moving toward Istanbul. But in this season, there's always that question of where He has led us to and the timing of Him doing it. And at times, it becomes hard to trust. It's very easy to try to run really far out in front of God or to stay really far behind with heels dug in and having Him pulled along. But the call for us is to keep walking out trust of our Lord. One of the beautiful things we find in this passage is a prophecy that helps us to recenter and renew our trust. We find this in verses 67, starting in verse 67. Here we read, His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because He has come to His people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare a way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Here, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to speak about what Jesus was coming to do. He speaks forth God's reality in that moment. When we reflect on the fullness of what Jesus came to do here, it breaks us out of playing it safe or just participating in some kind of religious activity. Rather, what we see here in this passage is that we are called into the greatest movement in history. Let me say that again. We are called into the greatest movement in history. The coming of Jesus. And how Jesus changes everything and has called us into His movement. Now at times... We simplify Jesus' coming, and we might say, you know, what is the purpose? And you say, well, he died for my sins. But here we see that he came to do that, absolutely. But he also came to do so much more. His coming changed everything for Zechariah, and his coming changes everything for those who will choose to follow him with their all. So let's look at this good news that we see here. Starting in verse 68, we see that He is redeeming us. This image of Moses leading the Israelites out of captivity. We've been rescued from sin, but also from the ultimate enemy, our adversary, Satan. Verses 69 to 71, we read that He is the victor. The horn of salvation we read about here. It's a symbol of victory. You see, Jesus is the new king. And while the oppressive Herod might have still been on that physical throne, and while there have been many oppressive rulers to follow him through the years, Jesus is the victor. He rules and he is bringing his kingdom to earth as it already is in heaven. The oppression is lifting. Verse 72, he shows mercy. He has seen the pain and heard our cries. He has seen the injustice and the darkness. And now he is reaching into the ordinary to show us his mercy in Jesus' coming. Salvation and wholeness are here for us to walk out. Verse 72 to 73, we see that he is faithful. The waiting is over. He kept the promise that was made again and again through the prophets to generations of people. He made a promise to bless the nations through Abraham's family. And now he is fulfilling that promise in the coming of Jesus. 
verses 74 to 75, we see that he rescues us for purpose. We're rescued from enemies, we read here, but we are rescued to partner with God in what he's doing. We now can live in holiness, lives of justice and wholeness. We don't serve out of fear, but out of love in return to our God who has shown his love and grace to us. Verse 77 to 79, he leads us out of darkness onto the path of peace. There's this radical transformation that is occurring here. We are becoming God's people who resemble him. We're changed from the inside out. We've become people of light. Rescued from darkness, we become people of peace, people of shalom. Jesus, the Messiah, calls us out of darkness and calls us to be children and citizens of a new kingdom. We become children of the kingdom of light. So Jesus' coming means that we can know God and we can love Him and we can love others. So today, may the good news of Jesus' coming lead us out of the dark places and lead us into His extraordinary way. You know, may we believe that God can use us as ordinary people, doing ordinary tasks day after day, wondering if they really make any difference at all. But may we expect Him to break in with the extraordinary, to change everything just like that, like He did for Zechariah. And may we trust Him every step of the way to show Himself and to continue to prove Himself faithful. Today, we're going to respond through the Lord's Supper. We're going to respond to this good news, the fullness of what Jesus has done. To respond to the way that our God breaks into our ordinary lives with the extraordinary, with His extraordinary love and His extraordinary mission. So may we be a people who believe and expect and trust. In a moment, we will take a cup and take some bread very ordinary elements. When Novus was still open, I mean, that's where we bought our grape juice, across the street, just in the supermarket. There's nothing special about it, just ordinary grape juice. I don't know where we get our bread from, but it's nowhere special either, I'm pretty sure. Yet when we take that piece of bread and we take that cup, we believe that God does something extraordinary in that moment. Because in these very simple elements, we're remembering the extraordinary coming of Jesus and all that he has done through the cross and resurrection. We also know that we're promised that the Holy Spirit is present to us when we take of the cup and take of the bread. And so we expect that God will do something among us. So today, while we engage in this ordinary ritual, a ritual that some of us have done hundreds of times and others of us have done thousands of times, may we come today full of expectation because of the fullness of Jesus' coming. And may he bring a transformation inside of us from the inside to the outside. To prepare ourselves to come to the table, I'd like us to stand and read together this prophecy that God put in the mouth of Zechariah. As we read it, may we be challenged by the fullness of what Jesus has come to do. And may we respond. Let's read together. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to His people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David, as He said through His holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember His holy covenant, the oath He swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness before Him all our days. Please be seated.